All right. All right, welcome everyone. Nice to see you. Welcome to the library. My name is Troy Swanson. I'm the library department chair. Um, we are very honored to welcome Dr. Amani Wazwaz, who's a faculty member in literature and communications. She's doing a series of talks uh, for us on um, ancient Muslim scholars and um, helping fill kind of a knowledge gap, at least for me, of jumping from ancient Greeks um, into uh, Western, Western thought. I'm probably not doing a good job describing it, but it's, it's I feel like a, a blind spot in our cultural history of where knowledge grew and was added to and evolved. This is part of the Mosaics uh, grant through our Fine and Performing Arts Center, which is supported by the, Dor the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. <laughs> so I'm very honored to host this. This is the second talk out of three. Yes. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thanks, Manny. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much, Troy. Thank you, everybody, for, for being here and for joining me uh, on this discussion. And I want to begin by saying, for the longest time ever, humanity has always been very interested in where are we? What is this world that we live in? What is this earth? What does it look like? We look out at night and we look to the sky for answers. The sky, the stars, what, what are they? And in the morning at the sun, and what is its relationship to Earth? And why, why is it there? And at night, the moon, why is it present? And we look to understand the moon, the sky, the stars, so that we could understand our world and ourselves as well, too. This continues on till today. I mention astronomy and the moon and the stars to my students, and they're very fascinated, and they tell me how much they love astronomy, and they love learning about the Earth and science. And the same thing occurred. The same thing was felt by the ancients as well, too. And the ancient Greeks, Indians, and the Persians contributed so much to our understanding of astronomy and the world as well, too. In the history of humanity, cultures have always exchanged ideas with one another. There is no shame in that. People exchange ideas. People learn from one another. People take what other cultures have produced and they add on to it their very own ideas. So for example, the ancient Greeks, they took a lot from the Babylonians. They learned medicine from the ancient Egyptians. They learned astronomy from the Babylonians. This exchange of ideas between cultures has gone on for a very long time. The same thing as well too, when we get to the rise of Muslim civilization as well, too. And what I want to particularly focus on is the Abbasid Empire. And I want to focus on particularly this gentleman here by the name of Khalif al Ma'mun, because he was deeply fascinated with learning and he was obsessed with what other cultures had produced. And what he did was, he called out for his scholars to translate as many of the ancient Greek and Indian and Persian texts as possible. And a lot of these translators were Christian, they were Jews, they were also Muslim. And some of these early translations from the Greek, they were turned into the Syriac language Syriac is a Semitic language, and from the Syriac, it was translated into Arabic. So what he did was he had this body of knowledge in the House of Wisdom, and the House of Wisdom is an academic institution. It's a vibrant library where people interact with one another. They share translations. And what they did was they picked up what the ancient Greeks, Persians, and Indians did, and they shared it with one another. And the scholar Jim and Khalili has noted that what the early Muslims, early Muslim scholars did was they noticed these 
ancient civilizations contributed very high quality insights about our world and about us. Many amazing calculations in astronomy, many amazing insights about the world, but they were not uniform. There was a difference. And Jim Al Khalili argues the following. What makes Muslim civilization give so much back to the world is the fact that it aimed for uniformity. It aimed to make sure that the observations from different cultures and the calculations were all the same together. Because if one great culture is saying one thing, and another great ancient culture is saying another thing, and yet you have another one is coming up with brilliant ideas, and then you're putting all three, four of them together, and there's not a similarity. Where is the scientific truth to all of this? Where is it that we as a humanity are going to move forward? Jim al Khalidi says, pause and really think about this. This is a revolution that we should stop and reflect and think about the great contributions that the Muslims have given. So he notices this. What the Muslims are very interested in doing is taking all of these calculations and redoing them. Taking a look at all of these insights and making more observations so that there would be some kind of unity. If we're looking at our world and the earth and the sky and the stars and different people are saying different things, we are not moving forward as a human civilization. We have to agree that something is working similarly. So this is what he has to say. Muslim civilization gave the rise, the birth of the scientific method. And this is coming from his book, The House of Wisdom, where he has studied the contributions of many uh, scientists during the rise of the golden age of Islam. And he's noticed this way of thinking is something that we should really pay attention to and something that we should really prize and understand. Case in point, okay? Let's go now to the ancient Greeks, Ptolemy, one of the greatest and most brilliant ancient Greek thinkers. His book, The Almagest, notice it bears the mark of Arabic translation with the Al, Al meaning the, the majestic, Almagest. Ptolemy, the great ancient Greek thinker, did this. He looked at his own civilization and he collected the scientific observations and calculations of his very own people, his very own culture. What I have here uh, is a statue of Hipparchus, who is also a great Greek thinker and a great Greek astronomer who gave the world back so many incredible insights. Ptolemy collected the insights of Hipparchus and other ancient Greeks in the book the Almagest. Again, one gentleman collecting the thoughts of people in one book alone. And what he has in the Almagest are the following. He describes the celestial motions, Jim al Khalidi says. He describes solar and lunar theories, catalog of stars. He builds on um, Hipparchus. Hipparchus had cataloged so many stars. And he added on more, equaling up to 1,022. So I want to stress there is no shame whatsoever in learning what somebody else has done before you, looking at it, critiquing it, and adding on to it. And then he has also in the Almagest the theory of the planets. It's all there, all together. Fast forward for Muslim civilization. If you want to be a part of the House of Wisdom, an astronomer to contribute more knowledge to humanity, you had to know the Almagest. You had to know it front and back, and you had to know it very well. 
and there was a lot to cover. I just want to pause and tell you, this is that uh, Ptolemy envisioned that our Earth was the center of the universe. And uh, from my understanding, from what I have read, they did not question this. They questioned other things. But this is how he envisioned it. But he envisioned a very sophisticated way that, that the moon and the sun moved around this Earth. But still, planet Earth is the center, okay? Very highly respected. He also did something else besides the Almagest, which was these astronomical tables. And this was also very interesting knowledge. Jim al Khariri says, these astronomical tables, the handy tables, they contained all the data needed to compute the position of the sun, the moon. Now, and now I'm telling you, this is ancient knowledge. This is, these are people who do not have the sophisticated instruments that we have now. But he's got this data to compute the position of the sun, the moon, and planets, the rising and setting of the stars, as well as the eclipses of the sun and the moon. All, not just in the Almagest. The Almagest is huge already. These are the handy tables. Muslim scientists are fascinated, fascinated with the Almagest, fascinated with these handy tables. They're fascinated with the astronomical tables. So what do they do? Just like T Ptolemy himself learned from Hipparchus, they're also looking and they're learning from him. They are learning from him as well too. And they're adding on to it. So they're adding on to the knowledge that Ptolemy had. They're also questioning it. And that's something really important to keep in mind. But as for the astronomical table, it becomes a model for them. So they go and they look at what he has done and they decide to also observe the stars as well too and create their very own. So Jim al-Khariri says this, the handy table served as a model for Arabic astronomical table or the star chart, which was called the Zij. Okay? And I am going to show you here how they took this from the Greek. I don't have a translation into the Syriac of the astronomical table, but I've looked at it for different translations in uh, biology and chemistry and other fields. I'm showing you the one that went into Arabic. What we have here is really interesting. We have the text over here is in Arabic, and it's translated by a gentleman by the name of Ishaq, who was Christian and who knew Arabic, and who knew Greek, and who also knew Syriac. I mean, he even translated the Old Testament and just did contributed so much tremendously during the, uh, the, 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 during the Islamic uh, Golden Age. So he did the text. Another gentleman by the name of Thabit also worked on the translation. And what you had during Islamic civilizations is that people would translate, and then years would go by, and people were not satisfied. People would learn Greek and Syriac, and, and they'd learn the fundamentals of Arabic language so well, they'd go back to these language, to these translations and read the Greek again, the Syriac and the Arabic, and fix it and add on to it, because translation is not very simple. Take what the Greek said, add it to the Arabic. It's not like that. Translation is an art of and within itself. So this took a lot of time. So you have here a collaboration of different scholars. And what you have here for the star catalog is Al-Hajjaj adding on to this a few decades later. And I have, I have more over here of the Arabic version. And I also found this. Um, this is a YouTube video of what they have at the library at Pennsylvania. And they're preserving this. This is uh, the Almagest translated from the Greek into Arabic in the 14th century in uh, 1382. 
And what you have, do you see the cover? The cover is contemporary. Uh, at first I was like, oh, so this is surviving like from a thousand years ago, you know, from 700 years ago, no. This is a more recent edition, but you have the bulk of the text is actually an original Arabic translation and well taken care of in the University of Pennsylvania. And I highlighted here from YouTube, uh, it's written in Spain in uh, 1381, not 82. And it's an Arabic translation of the Almagest. And here you get a sense of what it looks like. You could see the top portion. Unfortunately, is, there is damage, but there is an attempt to preserve it. These documents are precious. There are so many of these documents, maybe roughly 10,000 documents that survived from the Muslim civilization. Unfortunately, a lot of them were burned, but those that did survive are out there. And the hope is that more scholars will read these because we're talking about thousands of texts that are available in Arabic. They have not been read properly. They have not been analyzed to understand the contributions of Muslim civilizations. But this one is at the University of Pennsylvania. If you know, for those who are interested in this kind of scholarship. Now I want to go back. Khalif al Ma'mun, as I mentioned, was this phenomenal uh, leader, Muslim leader, who put in a lot of funding into encouraging scholarship in the Muslim world. And what he did was he founded an observatory in a district called Ashamasiye, which is in modern day Iraq. And what he did was he wanted his scholars to take a look at what the ancient Greeks and ancient civilizations had created. And he wanted them to test out their observations and their calculations in a particular place. So Khalif al Ma'mun did two amazing things. Number one, the House of Wisdom, the academic, vibrant library full of scholarship, where a lot of these debates and translations were going on. And then he has, in the Shammasiya district of modern day Iraq, he has an observatory to test out ancient knowledge. Jim al Khalidi says this While the notion of an observatory was certainly not new, ancient civilizations had it. Jim al Khalidi stresses what you now have is royalty funding this, which means that all these, pe these people are taking their wealth and wealthy patrons, and they're giving their money to science and to the advancement of science. So he says, never before had one been created as genuine scientific institution. And this is really important. So observatories were there, were present, but as a state-funded institution, this is something new that we see in Islamic civilization. Jim al Khalili stresses that in these institutions, in the observatories, you had, the king had ordered for his scholars to take a look and examine that the, observa uh, the observations that were created by the Greeks. Observe the moon, observe the sun. There was really intense observation back in the day with people keeping records of what they were seeing in the skies and keeping tables of the stars and their calculations. So it was a very exciting field to be in. And the king made sure, the caliph I mean, he made sure that he would select his strongest scholars, the people who were most interested and very adept at the sciences and mathematics. So what you have here is a gentleman by the name of Yahya ibn Abi Mansur, and he distinguished himself by his intelligence. He was an older gentleman. He worked in the observatory for two years, and unfortunately, he passed away in 830.
but he took on a lead role. With his wisdom, with his knowledge, Khalif al Ma'mun relied on him tremendously. There was also, you need good people to do good things. There was also another gentleman by the name of Sanad ibn Ali al Yahudi. And this gentleman was uh, Jewish, and he was the youngest one of the group, and he and the other older gentleman, Yahya ibn Abi Mansur, worked tremendously together in the observatory. So you want to make advances, you get the strongest scientific minds in the Abbasid Empire. There's Sanad ibn Ali al-Yahudi. There is also another gentleman who distinguished himself with his intelligence and his observations, and he was also well-read. Sanad, let me just go back, had also read Ptolemy's Almagest and knew it right in front, you know, left and back. All of these people were very well-versed. They knew the knowledge that the ancient Greeks had created. Another gentleman, uh, Al-Abbas Al-Jawhari, would hold conversations at his home about astronomers and astronomy with all of these different people. Another gentleman to distinguish himself is Al-Khawarizmi. Does anybody here know Al-Khawarizmi? What has he distinguished himself in? Anybody know? Okay. He tends to be more known than the other gentlemen. It's because of algebra. Okay, that's how he is known. He is known because of the books and ideas that he created on algebra and modifying Indian numerals, you know, and he is pretty much a math genius. So, of course, the caliph is going to call him in because to understand our world around us, you do need a mathematician. There's also another gentleman, okay, Al Farghani, and he also distinguished himself, but in a different way, and it was good to have him on board as well. He created what is called the nilometer, okay, and I want to show you this. So in Egypt, you've got the Nile River, and you need it. You need it for prosperity. You need it so that life will go on. The problem is, if the water levels go really high, there's a threat of flooding. If there is not enough water, then what you have is people might starve. People might starve. There is not enough water. So what uh, al Farghani did was he created the ni nilometer. And what you notice here is, it's a building, and this building has this huge column. And do you notice there are tunnels? Do you see those? There are tunnels, and what it does is the water goes in there. That column over there, it has markings on it. They're roughly one inch apart, and people are able to realize and keep, keep records. Okay. Has it gone above too much? Then, oh no, the Nile River might flood. Is there too little? There's a threat of a drought. This building survives in artwork, but it's still around. This building is still in Egypt. What you have, Jim al Khalidi um, himself visited this, and he went downstairs, just like what you see here. In the picture, you go downstairs, you see over here the tunnel. I don't know if the audience can see it. Do you see the scratches on, on the column? Can you see it over here? These are one inch apart, all of these. OK. All right. And want to be careful over here. Make sure none of this, you know, keep a record, constantly keep records. I mean, the, bu the building is phenomenal. It is just absolutely just beautiful in architectural design. I mean, and if you look, it even like has a dome, and the dome has these mosaics on it. And he distinguished himself this way. Not only is the nilometer just amazing, but just the very fact that people 
people in, you know, are keeping records day by day. This is where the water is. This is where it's at. And to understand the world around us, we got to understand, we got to take measurements. We got to keep a record of what is going on. And this way, we can monitor our, wor our world around us. So you have these group of scientists, these astronomers, and they're very interested, and they're very adept and intelligent and knowledgeable. And as you could see, each one is contributing something to their own fields. Now for Al-Farghani and Al-Khawarizmi, it's more understood what they left behind. Others, we have to dig a little deeper and more scholarship should be done on them. But they did contribute. Okay, they contributed. They did a great job. And Al-Ma'moon, Khalif Al-Ma'moon, being the cur curious science um, caliph that he was, he's like, you know, you want science, you want great understanding. We can't have just one observatory. We got to have another one. The first one was in Shamsiya in Iraq. The second one that he created was in Syria. And so the first one ran from 828 to 829, where they had all of these observations. The second one in 830, in 830 and it was by uh, this church in Mount Qasyun in Damascus. He told all of these scholars, go back and repeat everything again. Repeat it, because that's the only way that you're going to attempt to seek truth. Now, I mentioned that the lead scientist in Shamasiyya had passed away. So another gentleman by the name of Khaled Al-Malwardi, he took on a lead role over here. And from 832 to 833, this observatory in Syria, they also redid the very same lunar and solar observations, the very same ones in Shamsiyya. They redid them again. In our day and age, that's perfectly fine. Science is about doing and redoing experiments. But for somebody to be thinking of this 1,200 years ago, this is definitely progress. So these scientists, which who consisted of the former scientists, part former scientists, except for the gentleman, who passed away, redid these experimentations, and they came up with another star chart that they called al zij and al mumtahan uh, the verified tables. So they redid it, put uh, both of their ideas together, and created this more verifiable star chart, which was also pretty impressive because they're sharing ideas with one another. Okay, so. They checked, they checked the stars, observed the moon, observed the observations of Ptolemy, kept on checking, and then they said, you know, Khalif al-Ma'moon wanted to check once again for another thing, which was the circumference of the earth. Now you're all thinking, the circumference of the earth, this means that they understand that the earth was round. Yeah, they did. They did. Plato and Aristotle did. They, they understood it. They came to this conclusion not from a scientific experiment, but looking around at the world. The moon is round. The sun is round. The gods are perfect. The God, you know, a circle is a beautiful shape, the most beautiful shape. So this is what they created. Okay, so God, the gods must have created an earth that was round as well, too. Okay, fine. But there is a Greek scientist, um, Eratosthenes, uh, who said he's a great librarian, a great mathematician, and he said, you know, we have to double check. We can't just base it on gut feeling. The gods must have created the earth to be round because the gods are going to create something beautiful. We really have to do something scientific. 
And what he did was he got this document, an ancient Egyptian document, and in this document, somebody had written down that on the longest day of the year, in Syen, which is a swan now in Egypt, in Syen, at noon, when the sun reaches the highest, there are no shadows. There are no shadows whatsoever, which means what? It means that the sun is directly overhead. So if all of these buildings are not casting a shadow, the sun is directly overhead. So he said, okay, I am going to trust this observation. And what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to go to Alexandria, which is further away in Egypt. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick. I, I'm going to put a stick in the ground, and I'm going to see if there is no shadow at noon on June 21st. It means the earth is flat, okay? But no, what happened was he put this stick um, on the ground, and he noticed it did cast a shadow in Alexandria. And that shadow was 7.2 degrees. He had another, he had a gentleman walk, literally walk from Syene to Alexandria and count the paces that he took from this very long walk from Syene to Alexandria. And what he did was this. Okay. So he measured, he measured the shadow over here, and the angle is 7.2 degrees. And he did these calculations, and he said this. Okay, here is, Syene is over here. These are the buildings with no shadows cast on June 21st. Over here is Alexandria with the shadows being cast, and it's 7.2 7 degrees here, he said, if you are to draw a line down over here, this is going to be 7.2 degrees. This is what, you know, if they were to meet over here at the center of the earth. Using math, mathematics, he did the following. Okay, so the circumference of the earth, you know, a circle is 360 degrees. So 7.2 degrees over 360. The gentleman who walked uh, from Syene to Alexandria said, I took this many paces. This many paces, he translated them into the Greek unit stadia, which is roughly about 800 kilometers. He did math, okay? He did, you know, his version of math, and he reached a very, very close estimate, which was incredibly impressive. He had nothing, okay? He did not have all of these instruments that we have now. Okay, Muslim scientists, again, very fascinated by this, and it's also, you know, covered in ancient e uh, Greek uh, texts. Let's redo it. Let's see, are we also going to get a similar number as well, too? So they did, they created two experiments where Al Ma'mun took all of these astronomers as well as all of these scientists and carpenters and metal workers. And he said, This is what we're going to do. We're going to be at one place and we're going to walk different directions and we're going to stop until one angle has been formed, and we're going to redo the calculations. They came up with an almost similar numbers that the ancient Greeks did as well, too. There was a small margin of error. So they're satisfied for a while. They're like, wait a second. The numbers are almost the same as the one obtained by the ancient Greeks. So Maybe, maybe, since there is a similarity, there must be some kind of truth. Okay, but science is not meant to rest. Humans are not meant to arrive at a truth, and it's always, it's done and over with. So what happened was the following. We have 
a great scientist by the name of El Biruni, who's like, but wait a second, when you walk, when you're taking paces and you're counting them, like the ancient Greeks did, like the Muslims in the ninth century did, really how powerful of a result are you getting as you are walking? Is walking really accurate? It's not. So what he did was, I'm not going to walk. I'm not doing any of this. I am going to use mathematics to measure the, circum the circumference of the earth. And I am going to let you see the scholar Jim al Khalili describe what El Biruni did in his very own words. Later. Okay. And can we go to 1730? While Troy is setting this up, I, I want to tell you what El Biruni did was phenomenal as well, too. I love what uh, the ancient Greek Eratosthenes did with measuring the angle with the stick. I love what later on the Muslims did. And what El Biruni had to do with mathematics, he got much closer to the circumference of the earth with just mathematics alone, which is also excellent. knowledge had been translated into Arabic, so scholars could scrutinize and improve on it. Out of this obsession with scholarly learning came a true mathematical visionary, Abu Rayhan Muhammad ibn Ahmed al-Bayruni. And like all Islamic scholars of the time, al-Bayruni was obsessed with the science and mathematics of the ancient Greeks, Babylonians, and Indians. And because of the success of the translation movement, he had literally on his desk the great work on geometry by Euclid, Ptolemy's Almagest, the Indian text, the Sinhind, and the famous work on algebra by Al Khwarizmi. Professor Chalubi has brought along the book in which El Bayruni describes how he combined algebra and geometry with some very simple and practical measurements to solve the epic problem of how to calculate the size of the earth. Uh, this is, this is his, uh, the, the Mas'udi canon. This is Beiruni's canon, which I've been trying to get hold of, um, where he describes this, this uh, fantastic experiment. And, oh, you found the page. Yes. Having read Al Bayruni's description of how to estimate the size of the world, I wanted to try it for myself. First, he had to find a fairly high mountain from the top of which he could see a flat horizon. In this case, the sea. What I love about this story is that with a few simple measurements around this small mountain peak, you can work out the size of the whole world. Al Bayruni's first step was to work out the height of the mountain. He did this by going to two points at sea level, a known distance apart, and then measuring the angles from these points to the mountain top. So to measure the angle to the mountain top, 
Beruni had to use a device like this called an astrolabe. It's basically a giant protractor. It has the angles and My team and I always had trouble managing Sucks. our task <laughs> okay. until one of my colleagues found Monday. Side and a pointer to help him determine his line of sight. So if we try now and determine the, the angle to the top, it has to hang freely. And then, okay, so if you let it hang. I'd like to stress, if you haven't noticed already, that Al Rooney would have made his measurements more meticulously than I am. He did them again and again to get consistently reliable results. Okay, that's about it. And that is 24 and a half degrees. Okay, so now we've determined one angle. We now have to go and pick our second spot along the beach. The distance from the first to the second point must be measured accurately. In this case, it's 100 meters and the two points must be in a straight line with the mountain. I measured the second angle to be about 26 and a half degrees and now had enough information to calculate the height of the mountain. Using trigonometry and algebra, El Bayrouni used a formula that relates the height of the mountain to what are known as the tangents of the angles he measured. Using my measurements, I get a figure for this mountain of about 530 meters. I now need only one more measurement to get the size of the earth. And to get that, I have to climb to the top of the mountain. What Beiruni did next was measure the angle of the line of sight to the horizon as it dips below the horizontal. So we're going to try and reproduce that. So if you can lift it up so that it's hanging. And if I locate the horizon, okay, which is about half a degree, which is about the value that Beiruni got. Now here's the really ingenious part. Beiruni had measured four quantities, three angles and a distance. He used two of the angles and the distance to work out the height of the mountain. Al Bayrouni now had everything he needed. In essence, Al Bayrouni imagined a huge right-angled triangle, which has as its three corners, the mountain top, the horizon, and the center of the earth. Trigonometry told him that the angle he had measured and the height of the mountain are related to the radius of the earth and algebra allowed him to calculate it. With this formula, Beirun is able to arrive at a value for the circumference of the Earth that's within 200 miles of the exact value we know it to be today, about 25,000 miles. That's to within an accuracy of less than 1%, a remarkable achievement for someone a thousand years ago. So this is more accurate, more based on mathematics. The others were genius, were amazing. But there is a limit to counting the paces, walking, particularly walking in the intense heat of Iraq. This is far stronger because it's relying on math. And Jim Al Khalidi stresses that we're seeing now more of a reliance on science and mathematics to help us understand the world. It's not just Khalif al Ma'mun. Throughout Islamic civilization, we have observatories. More and more rulers are building these observatories. So, this Turkish uh, professor by the name of Ayadin Sayili. If I'm not mistaken, he studied at Harvard, and he studied Islamic science history at a grade and at so much depth. And what he said was this. In looking at all of these observatories, what you have in Islamic civilizations is the rise of observatories that are very large. They're very grand in scale. 
So a lot of money was poured into creating these observatories. Well, in order to have them, you needed to have people. You needed to have librarians. You needed to have people who are directing them. You needed to have the astronomers, the mathematicians, the scientists in this field. You had a lot of collaboration, people working with one another to retest calculations and retest scientific values. What you also needed to have is amazing instruments. You saw a little bit in the video. That's another presentation, a whole another workshop, a whole other presentation of the amazing um, astronomical instruments that they used during that time because the observatory had to be fixed in one place. The people had to find a place to go and work intensely on a daily basis to observe the sun, the moon, the sky, and to speak to one another and librarians helping them with their research as well too. A lot of money had to, had to go into this and the instruments. So I want to switch just a little bit and I'm gonna come back to this at the very end. Mapping the world was also very interesting to Muslim rulers and to Khalif al-Ma'mun. I wanna go back to him. His map, he looked at the, map of other, the maps of other civilizations and he updated it. And this time, the updated map is including Mecca. And Mecca is really significant because it's the holy city for Muslims. So mapping is about inclusiveness and adding more. Hey, this city is really important to Muslims, add it. And then he also did, did the following as well too. He also added Baghdad. Baghdad was not around when the ancient Greeks developed their map, their maps, so he added that as well too. There's also something very interesting about this. The Indian Ocean is more open. The Atlantic Ocean is more open as well too. For the ancient Greeks, they enclosed it. So we're seeing more and more inclusivity in the creation of maps. I want to now go back to observatories. There is a lot to be said and a lot to be studied, but this is Ulek Beg's uh, observatory, which is very impressive. And this is somebody's imagining of what the model of Ulek Beg's observatory may have looked like on the inside. I'm gonna end saying two things. Number one, okay, we look to the stars, to the moon, to the sun, to understand the world because by understanding the world, we can understand ourselves. But what we also do is we use the world to regulate who we are and to regulate our faith. So for example, for Muslims, Muslims are required to pray five times a day. So there has to be a very keen sensitivity to where the sun is at different times of the day and where the moon is as well too. Muslims also have to pray in the direction of Mecca five times a day. Knowledge of the earth and knowledge of direction will help one to become even more faithful because the Muslim concept of God is very deeply monotheistic and all Muslims should all point to one direction while they are praying. Muslims at one point in their lives must make the holy journey, the pilgrimage to Mecca, where they are spiritually cleansed, where they connect more deeply with God. So they need to know the proper direction to travel. So there is a very human, humanitarian concern with studying astronomy. There's also a very spiritual concern with it as well too. I wanna tell you in, in studying these astronomers, I rarely ever, find, and I, and I hope more research and more interest is directed to Muslim astronomers, to all astronomers, but because this tends to be very much overlooked, I imagine my surprise when I found out that a documentary was made on Ulek Beg, and this is what I'm going to leave you with at the very end. I thank you all, and 
the last video that I want you to see is like a little trailer of Ulrich Beg's life story. And maybe if you're interested, you might examine it, you might watch it on your own and just to see more because I rarely ever see anybody discuss any of this or anybody talk about any of these astronomers. So everybody, thank you so much for your attendance. So if you want to stick around for two, two and a half, four minutes. It's, uh, I don't have it linked. I need to go to Troy. Uh, can you help me go to uh, Internet Explorer, any of those? In 1974, American astronauts made an unusual request of their Russian counterparts. They asked us to go to the Cosmodrome to fly to Uzbekistan. What did we want? We wanted to be able to see the consequences of the life of Uzbekistan. This is the story of Ulug Beg. Born a prince, he rose to become king, and as ruler of Samarkand, instilled in his people a love of knowledge and the arts. 150 years before Galileo invented the telescope, Ulug Beg built the largest astronomical instruments on Earth, turning Samarkand into the center of the 15th century astronomy world. Renaissance thinker, visionary architect, gifted scholar. He made one of the first tables that underlie the geometry for constructing patterns like this. He built several madrasas or schools with the inscription, striving towards knowledge is the duty of every Muslim man and woman over the main gates. His greatest accomplishments still hold meaning today. Over the centuries, a bigger and bigger error had built up in the coordinates of stars, and Ulug Beg corrected that two centuries before telescopes were invented. After 38 years on the throne, his death, foretold in the stars, became reality. Самое, пожалуй, страшное, что Ulug Beg мог догадываться. Причиной его смерти станет один из сыновей или другой младший член семьи. Discover the extraordinary life of one of the greatest minds the world has ever known. Ulug Beg, the man who unlocked the universe. Any thoughts, any questions? Comments, thoughts, questions. Is anybody going to watch the documentary? It's about an hour, so it shouldn't be too bad. <laughs> My, Tommy, you might. <laughs> OK. OK. <laughs> Comments? Oh, that's awesome. That is. Yes, you did. Yeah, you did. You did. You read the book, you also have a thousand and one inventions and everything, yeah, so which is awesome. Well. That is a great book as well, too, yes. Comments from my dear audience, questions. <laughs> Professors are going to class, I understand. Okay. Yes, Christina. Christina, which one? Which one are you talking about? Nilometer, yes, nilometer. And if if you Google nilometer, you'll see some of the images that I got from there. There is also a video that Jim Al Khadiri was part of. It's called Science and Islam. If you put it on YouTube, 
somewhere around five minutes into that video, you'll see a discussion of the nilometer. Others, comments, questions? Okay. All right, nothing. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Appreciate your attendance. Thank you.